All right, ladies and gents, and the uh, local riffraff, otherwise known as Will. This is period three. It's from 1815, the Congress of Vienna, to 1914, the beginning of World War I. So we start off here with the Industrial Revolution, and it spread from England to the rest of Western Europe. And it's worth noting, before we get into the rest of Western Europe, that the English in 1851 built the Crystal Palace. Um, it wasn't actually made of crystal. It was made of cast iron and glass, so it kind of blew chunks. That's probably why they took it down. It was a blatant lie. The Industrial Revolution then spread to France around the mid-1800s, and uh, here the French government took an active role in the country's industry, more so than Britain, and it led to a much slower rate of industrialization, but more government subsidized railroads and canals, and a loss of this was due to the legacy of the French Revolution. Then around the uh, same time as France, the problem child of Europe, Prussia and soon to be Germany, also industrialized. And their industrialization was quite rapid because we all know how good the Germans are at doing things quickly and efficiently. Prior to German unification, the Zollverein, if I'm saying that correctly, probably not, was a trade agreement between the German states and that helped to bolster their economy. And once unified, the German government heavily subsidized industry and their transportation networks. This paired with Frederick List's national system, which called for heavy protective tariffs for German trade, enabled Germany to become a key player in industrialized Europe. A few of the things to mention about the Industrial Revolution was the uh, Bessemer process, which was a player in causing the Industrial Revolution because it was a more efficient way of producing steel, and this was by blasting hot air through the molten iron to remove impurities. And a major product of the Industrial Revolution was the steamboat, which allowed for a much more interconnected economy with all the creation of the canals. Moving on to 3.2, we're still talking about industrialization. We're talking about how it reshaped society. And it did this by creating new economic classes. You have the glorious, laborious working class. And then you have the bougie-ass families, the higher class. Along with the new economic classes, urbanization occurred because people wanted to work in the factories and they wanted to live near the factories. And this led to overcrowding and poor sanitation because the cities weren't prepared for this. And a lot of people died because of this, but also people died in the factories and the mines. There was a lot of death around this period, but it changed a bit in the mid-1800s, mainly in England, with the Factory Act of 1833, where they prohibited child workers under the age of nine. And then the Mines Act in 1842, where no girls or boys under 10 could work in the mines. And then the Ten Hours Act of 1847 does exactly what it sounds like it does. It stopped people from working more than 10 hours if they're between the ages of 13 and 18, or if they're just women. So now you have a bit of a fix to all the death that's happening in Europe right now. Just for women and children, though. If you're a normal guy, you're still on the deep end. Nearing the end of the century, there was an increase in the working class quality of life with better diets and increased access to birth control. So you weren't popping out another lame investment every time you wanted to have some sweet monkey love. There was also now much more leisure time, so people would take up recreational sports, and hang out at parks, loiter, go to museums, or pretend to like theatre or opera. There were also a few inventions that improved quality of life, like streetcars and bicycles that helped with local transport, as well as iceboxes, allowing for the preservation of food. A key idea of this time period was the cult of domesticity, which expected women to look pretty and make sandwiches, basically. Some places that were industrializing during this time were lagging behind in their agriculture, and this caused famines, uh, most notably in Ireland, the potato famine. Even though they could have just gone fishing, they are a bloody island. The serfdom in Russia was also pretty intense. A lot of them died because of starvation, uh, because they were basically slaves attached to the land that they worked on. And, you know, that they're not like Ireland. Like, they had a reason they couldn't do anything. The island just sort of sucks. Moving on to 3.3, the problems of overcrowding and poor sanitation were being fixed with the modernization of infrastructure. This was new sewage systems, public housing and lighting, and urban redesign. There was a sway in politics during this time. A lot of new conservatives and liberals. The liberals most notably being Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill, who were both proponents of utilitarianism, which, as you may figure, wanted to maximize utility, which they described as well-being and happiness. Another more liberal movement in England was the Anti-Corn Law League, 
which fought and won against abolishing the corn laws that levied taxes on imported wheat, thus raising the price, which also during this time the factories were trying to cut wages so people were having trouble paying for food. Labour parties also sprouted up because the damned workers want to just be selfish gits and not die at work and go back to their families and be happy and whatnot. And along with the Labour parties you had the Chartists, who wanted equal rights for the working class. This was mainly universal male suffrage. And now we finally have someone who comes in and represents women in society. We have Flora Tristan, who is most known for being named after plant life, but also for her work on feminist theory. The notable conservatives that popped up during this time include Edmund Burke, who is known as the father of modern conservatism, but I like to refer to him as Eggman Burke because he looks like an egg, just like that stupid fat old face. Another of the notable conservatives was Clemens von Metternich, who was a famous Austrian minister, and he was kind of the grand wizard of the Congress of Vienna, so blame him for all the crap that caused. Socialism also began to take root around this time. Robert Owens uh, was a socialist. He tried to create utopian societies, but failed miserably because utopian societies don't work. Charles Fourier was pretty cool. He wanted to create small sort of model communities where everyone got on. Uh, it's also imagine the Teletubbies. Marxism was also catching on at the time because it was kind of like the, the edgy ideology as it critiqued the expanding capitalism of the period. Uh, Frederick Engels aided Karl Marx in writing the Communist Manifesto. But if we're talking edgy ideologies, the closest one to the edge, the sharpest of the bunch, I'd say, was uh, anarchism. That began to sprout up, and in my wholehearted opinion, is the best form of government. And finally, there was a lot of nationalism encouraged in this time period, which I was just they wanted loyalty to the country, a lot of countries were trying to unify, if not already unified. Um, there was romantic idealism, there was chauvinism, and of course, anti-Semitism, who could forget? And a, a good example of this nationalism was Giuseppe Mazzini, who was an Italian nationalist who wanted to unify Italy. And then there was also Karl Luger, he was the mayor of Vienna. He was He's a good example of the anti-Semitism. And a uh, fun little fact, he was Hitler's celeb crush, you could say. Transitioning into 3.4, international stability. It's starting to wobble. A lot of revolutions are taking place. A lot of wars popping up. The war of Greek independence was fought. Uh, it was fought over whether it was pronounced gyro or euro. And it ended with a stalemate and a renaming of the dish to the Donner Kebab. They were also freed from Ottoman control with assistance from England, France and Russia but that was the more minor part of the war. The Decemberist Revolt in Russia was another revolution, um, and it was the first modern revolutionary movement in Russia, and it was crushed. So that's all there really is to say about that one. But then you have the Polish Rebellion, uh, which was also crushed uh, by Russia, though, and uh, Poland was then declared a province of Russia, though we all know it belongs to Germany, really. We also have another revolution in France, that's a bit different, isn't it? Uh, this was the July Revolution, and it saw the overthrowing of Charles X and the granting of a throne to Louis-Philippe. Then there's the Crimean War, which was a mess. And this was uh, Russians invading the Ottomans, and uh, France and Britain just joining because they wanted to gain influence in that area, and they helped the Ottomans fight off the Russians. There was a bit of a new era of leaders during this time. You've got Napoleon III, uh, Cavour, also von Bismarck, and they all created sorts of nationalist states. Uh, Alexander II, the Tsar of Russia, abolished serfdom. No one really liked him though. He did that, that was pretty cool. Um, Cavour, he united northern Italy, and Bismarck united Germany. Bismarck used uh, real politic, realistic politics, to industrialize the military. He also tried to isolate France through the Triple Alliance, so Germany, Italy, and Austria Hungary. Um, and once Bismarck was dismissed in 1890, the European tensions were heightened because of these alliances. And these tensions grew into the Congress of Berlin in 1878. And this Congress decided that all major European powers would reorganize the Balkans. This didn't really work because Europe can't seem to do anything right. 
and it led to the First Balkan War in 1912, where the Balkan League won their independence from the Ottomans. But then, uh, fast forward a bit, the Second Balkan War breaks out, Bulgaria attacks Serbia uh, and Greece, Romania pops in, and the Ottomans take back their lost land, so kind of cancel out the wars, eh? Never really happened, did it? Shifting into 3.5, European global control was bolstered during this time period uh, through imperialistic practices. Africa, India, and Asia were targeted for the natural resources. Europeans used social Darwinism and racial superiority to quote-unquote justify imperialism. The scramble for Africa was a major part of this period, and it resulted after the Berlin Conference, and it split Africa in between the major European powers. Britain had the Cape to Cairo sort of idea, um, and they butchered the Zulus because they had machine guns and the Zulus had short spears. This sort of genocide of the Zulus, though, kind of went under the radar as, a, as Belgium, if you could have guessed it, sort of came in and saved Britain from that bad guy status as King Leopold II had a hand fetish, so he had chopped off all the Congolese hands if they didn't collect enough rubber for his uh, rubber fetish. Then we also have Rudyard Kipling, who wrote The White Man's Burden, which egged on the U.S. to civilize the South Americas, and it also became a, a symbol of the imperialistic ideology of this time period. There are also a few rebellions against the imperialistic nations. You have the Sepoy Mutiny in India. Um, that failed, and it resulted in direct control of India by Britain. You have the Chinese Boxer Rebellion as well, which was fought against the foreign devils. Uh, though the Chinese fought with martial arts, they thought it would help them withstand bullets. So you can guess who won that one. And if you take away anything from 3.5, it's that Europe is racist and mean. And finally here we have 3.6. We're going to end it off on a lighter note. We're going to talk about art and culture in Europe during this time. And they start to reflect scientific realism and self-expression. So you have Beethoven and Chopin, who are both heavily influential composers. You've got the Romantic Ideas, which was focused on nature, moving away from industrialized society and self-expression. These Romantic poets included William Wordsworth, Lord Byron, who was a stud, uh, Percy Shelley, John Keats, and Mary Shelley. Uh, you have Charles Darwin, who found biological evidence for the evolution and, sadly, inadvertently called social Darwinism. I'm sure you can see the connection with the uh, the names there. It's not too difficult. Then you also have Max Planck, who fathered quantum theory. Uh, I won't pretend to know anything about that. Um, then there's Sigmund Freud. End off on him. He's the most fun. He created some radical psychological theories because he had a crush on his mum and he wanted to justify it. <laughs>